Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Lewis. I'm lead pastor here at City Awakening. Welcome to those of you who are here on site, and welcome to those of you who are watching this service online. We're glad you're joining us online. At this time, we can go ahead and dismiss our children to Children's Church, and if you didn't get a chance to check your child in, please see our children's ministry leaders in the back, and they would be more than happy to assist you with that. Today, we are continuing our teaching series that we've been doing on a book of the Bible called Psalms, and this is a series that is all about helping to give us melodies of encouragement for everyday life. The psalm that we are studying today is all about God speaking to us. It's about how God's always speaking to us, but we aren't always willing to pause to listen. As I was prepping this message uh, for this week, I read a story about a Cherokee Indian man who was visiting his friend who lived in New York City. And as they were walking together through Times Square, you know, it was very noisy. If you've ever been to Times Square before, you know how noisy it can get. I mean, it was just very noisy from all the people, from, from all the sirens, from all the, the taxis honking their horns and yelling at each other. It was extremely noisy. But as they're walking through Times Square, all of a sudden the Cherokee man paused and he said, I, I hear a cricket. And he paused and he And he listened. And sure enough, he found a cricket sitting in the dirt of a potted plant. His city friend said, man, that's incredible. How in the world could you hear a cricket in all this noise? And the Cherokee man said, it all depends on what you're listening for. He then grabbed coins that were in his pocket and he dropped them on the ground And sure enough, several people around them stopped for a minute to look and see if they dropped some money. The Cherokee man said to his friend, he said, see, it it all depends on what you're listening for. He said, see, I'm listening for the sounds of nature. But most city people, they're listening for the sounds of their money. What is it that you're listening for? As you go through daily life, what is it that you're listening for? As you're going through daily life, is it possible that you and I, that we are missing hearing God speak to us because we aren't always willing to take the time to pause to listen? You know, in the 15th century, there was a scientist by the name of Francis Bacon. He's often contributed for uh, developing the scientific method. Well, at one point, he had said that, you know, uh, that God speaks to us through two books. He said through the book of creation and through the book of Scripture. Bacon said this. He said, there are two books to study to prevent falling into error. First, the volume of Scripture, which reveals the will of God, then the volume of creation, which expresses his power. The psalm we're studying today talks about these two books that God speaks to us hundreds of years before Francis Bacon ever even developed the scientific method, before he even mentioned these two books. The psalm we're studying today is all about how God speaks to us through creation and through scripture. It's about how God is always willing to speak to us through creation and scripture, if we're willing to pause to listen. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them over to Psalm chapter 19. If you're new to your Bible, you can find the book of Psalms in the middle of the Bible. We'll also have the words on the screen for you. We'll be in Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 to 14. And for those of you taking notes, the title of today's message is, How Does God Speak to Us? And the big idea of the message is God is always speaking, but we aren't always willing to to listen. God is always speaking to us, but we aren't always willing to listen. A little bit of context here on the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is considered to be an Old Testament biblical hymn book that contains various different songs and prayers that can help to encourage us. They are written by Old Testament historical leaders who are expressing their real, raw, honest emotions that we can all relate with. Psalm 19 is written by King David, and it's considered to be a wisdom psalm because it is teaching us. It's teaching us two primary ways that God speaks to us. Not the only ways, but the primary ways that God speaks to us. He says it's through creation and through scripture. And so let's check it out. Let's see what King David has to say. 
Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 to 14 states, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. David says that the heavens are declaring God's glory. Meaning that the sun, the moon, the stars, the entire universe is declaring God's glory. But notice that he says it's happening 24-7, day after day, night after night. The entire universe is constantly declaring, speaking, communicating to us God's glory and the magnificent work of his creative hands. You know, astronomers, they estimate that the sun is orbiting around our Milky Way galaxy at the speed of 500,000 miles per hour. Now, as fast as that is, our galaxy is so big that the sun traveling at a speed of 500,000 miles per hour, it would still take the sun over 230 million years to complete just one orbit around our galaxy. That's how big our galaxy is. Yet astronomers also estimate that there are over a trillion galaxies that exist in the universe. Listen, the book of creation is far bigger, far more complex than we could ever imagine. I mean, in our entire existence of human history, we haven't even made it out of the intro of the book of creation. It is far bigger, far more complex than we could ever imagine, and yet it is all constantly declaring that God is far bigger and far more magnificent than we could ever imagine. A couple of weeks ago, I read an article written by a guy named Kevin Hartnett. Not Kevin Hart, Kevin Hartnett. And he worked for NASA for 40 years, 40 Well, his focus while he was working at NASA was primarily on developing uh, satellite control centers and also directing various different scientific missions, including the Hubble Telescope Space Program. He's responsible for helping to direct that. Back in April of this year, he wrote an article that, that was titled, The Cosmos Keeps Preaching. And in his article, he says this, Hartnett states, Many glorious attributes of God are now loudly and profoundly declared to us nightly from diverse space telescopes and ground observatories around the world. Among the qualities proclaimed are his intellectual genius, his endless creativity, his eternal power, and his exquisite, beautiful, purposeful craftsmanship and divine nature. Equally marvelous is the undeniable case that the deeper you look and the more you Listen, God's genius, creativity, power, and beauty only become clearer. Indeed, the heavens are declaring at this very moment that God, our God is magnificent beyond comprehension. This coming from a guy who has worked for NASA for 40 years in some pretty um, important you know, discoveries that we've had about our universe, like the Hubble Space Telescope Program. Both King David and Hartnett are saying that the universe, the entire universe is constantly declaring that God is magnificent. Again, verse 2, day after day they pour out speech, night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. Their message has gone to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the earth. In other words, what David is saying here is is he's saying that when God speaks to us through creation, it's visible, not verbal. It's visible communication, not verbal communication. So when God is speaking to us, he's saying that God is visibly declaring to us his existence. And he's, notice he says he's declaring his existence Throughout the whole earth, meaning to all creation. Now, theologians call this God's, uh, God's general revelation, which is where God is generally revealing himself to all people in the world visibly through his creation. The Apostle Paul actually refers to this in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, when he says, For God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. 
so they are without excuse. See, what Paul's saying is is that people who deny God's existence are without excuse because God is constantly declaring his existence through creation to the whole earth. I mean, think about it for a second. If a building declares there's a builder, if a watch declares that there's a watchmaker, if a painting declares that there's a painter, then the logical conclusion is that creation declares there's a creator. The builder, the watchmaker, the painter, they don't have to declare through verbal communication to prove their existence because their existence has already been declared and proven by the very objects they created. In a similar way, God does not have to use verbal communication to prove or declare his existence because his existence is already being declared and proven through the very objects that he's created. All of creation is constantly, visibly declaring to us God's existence. It's declaring God's glory. It's declaring his power. It's declaring how magnificent our God is. Again, verse 4. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. In other words, there's nothing in our world that isn't in some way affected by the sun's heat. Even though the sun is roughly 93 million miles away from earth, we can still feel its warmth and still enjoy its radiance. See, the implication is that it doesn't matter where we are in the world, we can still feel God's warmth and enjoy the radiance of his glory and presence. See, what we're learning here in these first six verses of this psalm is that God speaks to us through creation. What we're learning is God is constantly speaking to us, declaring to us, communicating to us his existence, his power, his beauty, his intelligence, and so much more. Through creation. John Piper states, open your eyes. Do you see it? Do you hear it? He shouts through the billowing clouds. He shouts through the endless blue summer sky. He shouts with gold on the horizon in the morning and through the breathtaking expanse of galaxies and stars at night. Don't you see it? Don't you love it? In all these things, he's shouting, I am glorious. In all these things, he's shouting, he's glorious. But see, the problem for the skeptic is they'll sometimes study and enjoy creation, but they don't ever pause to listen to creation shouting about their creator. The problem for the believer is we've come to realize that God is shouting at us about his creation, but we don't always take the time to pause to listen and to enjoy creation with our creator. Both skeptics and believers are often just so busy rushing through daily life that we rarely ever pause to be able to listen and to enjoy the gift that God has given us in creation. Paul Tripp states, God created an awesome world. He intentionally loaded the world with amazing things to leave you astounded. The carefully air-conditioned termite mound in Africa, the tart crunchiness of an apple, the explosion of thunder, the beauty of an orchid, the interdependent systems of the human body, the pounding of ocean waves, and thousands of other created sights, sounds, tastes, and touches. God designed all of it to be awesome, and he intended you to be daily amazed. But the problem is, we are often just rushing so hurriedly, so busy through daily life, that we tend to ignore all these amazing things in creation, like we ignore the pictures that are hanging on the walls in our homes. We often just are rushing through daily life that that we fail to pause to listen to even to enjoy the the beautiful sights of a sunrise, or the, the amazing, wonderful, melodic tune of a bird singing. We ignore all kinds of sights 
sounds, tastes, and touches that God has given us to be able to enjoy in creation with him. We're often so busy rushing through those things that that we don't even realize that what God is doing through creation is he's wanting to speak to us and to minister to us through his creation. See, through creation, God is wanting to speak to us about his existence, declaring his existence and his power and his glory to us, like David says. But he also wants to minister to us as we, we get to enjoy the refreshing day at the beach or the nice mountain view or, or the, the stars in the sky and be in awe and wonder over those stars and the creative works of his magnificent hands. Every day we have access to this incredible gift that God has given us in creation. The incredible gift every day of God speaking to us, ministering to us, refreshing our busted up, beat up lives. If only we are willing to pause to listen. See, the question isn't, is God speaking to us through his creation? Because he is. Instead, the question, question is, are we willing to pause to listen? Are we willing to pause to listen and to ponder his existence, his power, his glory, and to be refreshed by him? And the very gift of creation he's given us. Verse 7. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. So notice the, a little bit of a shift in the text here now. That, you know, the instruction and the testimony of the Lord is referring to Scripture. So David is saying that, that God speaks to us through creation, but also speaks to us through Scripture. Creation is God's visible communication to us about his existence. But scripture is God's verbal communication to us about who he is and what, what he's like. It's another incredible gift that God has given us to be able to sit down, to be able to read the Bible, to read scripture. And if we're willing to read it and pause and listen to its teachings, David says there's so many benefits to it. In fact, that's what he goes on to list. And the rest, he's listing a ton of benefits. We're going to go through them a little quick, but maybe you can go back home or even in your small groups and, and look at some of these benefits even more. But David starts listing some of the benefits that come with reading and trusting in Scripture, trusting in God's Word. Notice that, that he says in verse 7 that, that Scripture is perfect and it's good for renewing our imperfect lives. It is also trustworthy and, and can give us wisdom. It can make us wise. In other words, it, it always tells the truth in everything that it says, and it can always give us the best wisdom for how to live our daily lives. Verse 8, he goes on to say, The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. In other words, the scriptures are, are right in, in what they teach us, and they can always make our hearts glad. So that we don't have to keep, keep um, following, believing, chasing after wrong things that will never make our hearts glad. I mean, our society, our culture is always chasing all kinds of things. Even us, we, we sometimes chase all these different things that we think are going to be good and right for our lives and bring gladness to our lives. But it never does. It may feel good in the moment, may bring gladness or joy to our hearts in the moment. The high may feel good in the, in the moment that we're experiencing it. The buzz may feel great and numb the pains of our daily lives, but eventually the high is going to wear off, the buzz is going to wear off. Eventually that thing that we purchased and we thought, man, if I can get this, my life is going to be so much happier. But eventually all that high and that buzz and that gladness that we experience in that moment is going to go like that. And we're going to find our thirsty hearts searching again. David says God's word is right, and it can always make our hearts glad, because it helps to steer us away and even reset our hearts and our lives on God, who can always be the one that satisfies our soul and brings joy into our lives, restores our, bu restores our busted up lives again. He says that that God's word is radiant. It can help to, to light up our eyes. In other words, God's word can illumine our eyes to be able to see the difference between walking in, in the righteous ways of the Lord versus walking in the darkness of sin. Simply put, Scripture isn't a handcuff to our joy. It's the key to unlocking our greatest joy. Scripture isn't 
isn't a handcuff to your joy. It's the key that can help to unlock our greatest joys in the Lord. David goes on to say in verse 9, The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and righteous. They are more desirable than gold. They are an abundance of pure gold and sweeter than, than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In other words, the, the rich and sweet truths of Scripture are, are pure and, and they're everlasting. They're pure and they are reliable. Just like honey is sweet to the tongue, Scripture is sweet to the soul. The difference is that honey can only satisfy the tongue temporarily. But Scripture can point us to the very God who can satisfy our souls eternally. It's greater than that. Verse 11, in addition, your servant is warned by them. And in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Keep your servant from willful sins. Don't let, me, don't let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. In other words, God's uh, scripture, God's word, can also help to warn us to be able to see things that we can't see in ourselves. One of our core values here at City Awakening, one of, you know, we call it our code, like our genetic code, our genetic DNA as a church. Those are our core values. Right? One of our core values at the church is, is that, and you'll hear us say this often, we'll read the Bible and let the Bible read us. Because we believe reading the Bible is like getting an MRI done on our soul. It helps to scan our lives, scan our souls, to, to help us to see some of the, the sinful cancers that are growing in our lives, things that we cannot see in ourselves. Scripture helps us to be able to see things that we cannot see in ourselves. Verse 14, David says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accept to you, acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and redeemer. David is saying there are so many benefits to reading Scripture that he wants to meditate on it. Not just rush through his morning quiet time and then forget about Scripture the rest of the day. He wants to soak in it. He wants to meditate on it. He wants, wants God's Word, the Scriptures, to be on his heart as he's going throughout daily life. And so what we learn in verses 1 to 6 is God speaks to us through creation, but in verses 7 to 14, we learn that God speaks to us through Scripture. God's visible communication to us about his existence is through creation, but God's verbal communication to us about who he is and what he's like is in his uh, Scriptures. Now, this is, here's why this is important. It's because we can... No God logically exists through creation. But we can't know what God is personally like without Scripture. See, we can, we can get an idea, you know, even, you know, t even talk statistics and probability of all of life happening on its own. I mean, I did that, I think, a few weeks ago, right? So, so we can at least get somewhat of an idea of God's existence logically through looking at creation. But we cannot know what God is like personally without God's verbal communication through Scripture. We need God's verbal communication through Scripture to know what God is like. For example... Most of us would say that we believe that God is loving. Okay, most of us would say we believe God is loving. But how do you know that? How do you know that God is loving? Where did that, that idea come from? Where did that concept come from that God is loving? You didn't get it from looking at creation by itself. Because if you look at creation by itself, creation can sometimes be very violent, vicious, and unloving. Now, as beautiful as creation can be, it also can be very ugly, full of all kinds of diseases, decay, death, people hurting and killing each other. 
Just turn on the news and what are you going to find? You're going to see people hurting each other, people killing each other. You're going to see people at war with each other, people committing crimes against each other. Turn on the National Geographic channel and you're going to see animals hurting and killing each other, right? Predators being very violent and vicious, how they attack their prey, even eating their prey while they're still alive. So you can't get this idea that God is loving simply by looking at creation by itself. Because creation can be very violent, vicious, and unloving. This concept, this idea that God is loving, it does not come by looking at creation. It comes through God's verbal communication of Scripture. See, this is why it's important that we read scripture. You have to read scripture to know what God is like. You have to read scripture, you have to read the Bible to see what what scripture is declaring about who God is and what God is like. You have to read places in scripture like 1 John chapter 4 verse 8. God is love. You have to read places in Scripture like John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but shall have eternal life. We need God's verbal communication in Scripture like this to be able to know that God is loving. We need verbal communication through Scripture like this to be able to know that God is not just loving, but God is so loving that Jesus was willing to come and give up his life for you on the cross so that you can enjoy eternal life in heaven with him. We cannot know God's love by looking at creation alone. We know it by by reading scripture. We know it by reading the Bible. And by reading about Jesus, because Jesus is God's most visible and verbal display of God's love for us. Why? Because Jesus is God incarnate who chose to enter into his creation to be crucified by his creation for the sins, the forgiveness, the restoration of his creation. City Awakening, we can know God exists logically through looking at creation. But we cannot know God's love without reading scripture. We cannot know God's sacrificial love for us. And he's so loving without looking at the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus for us. The big idea of the message is that God is always speaking to us. But we aren't always pausing to listen. David says that God is always constantly speaking to us 24-7, you know, day after day, night after night, through creation and through Scripture. But we also need to be willing to pause, to listen. When you wake up in the morning, you can read Scripture. But then pause to listen what God is speaking to you through that Scripture. When you step outside to To go and face the day, you can enjoy the sights and the sounds of creation. But then pause to listen to what those things are teaching you about God's existence through his creation. When you're rushing through your day or you're feeling stressed out, burnt out, beat up from the day, which so many of us are going to feel tomorrow on Monday. You can now pause and you can go back to the scripture that you read that morning to remind yourself of what that scripture said to you in the morning and then take a few minutes to even step outside and, and to pause, take a, to breathe out a bit and to calm your stressed out, burnt out heart as you just remind yourself of his word, meditate on his word and be refreshed by his creation, the sights, sounds, tastes, touches of his creation again. See, listen, Jesus wants us to know him. If you're a skeptic, Jesus wants you to know him, to to hear us speaking, to hear him speaking through this text about his very existence. Start there. Got to give a better alternate explanation for 
how all of this came to be, then it just happened by chance on its own. Start there with the existence of God. But for all of us, Jesus wants us to know him and he wants us to walk with him and to be shaped by him. If he didn't want that for us, then he wouldn't have given us his revelation through, through creation and through scripture. The more we pause to listen to him speaking to us through creation, the more will we be in awe of his glory, his power, the magnificent work of his created hands. The more we pause to listen to him speaking to us in scripture, the more we will be in awe of his wisdom, his guidance, his sacrificial love for us that he poured out for us on the cross. We can know and walk with Jesus through creation and through scripture. Jesus wants you to know that you are loved by him, which is why he went to the cross for you. He wants you to know him, to be loved by him, and to be shaped by him. Our lives will never thrive as Jesus created and intended them to be if we are not relying on him to shape our lives daily. They will never thrive if we're too busy rushing through life without him. City Awakening. We have access every day to the incredible gift of Jesus speaking to us, ministering to us, refreshing us, shaping us through creation and through scripture. So the question isn't, is God speaking? It's, are we pausing every day to listen? The question isn't, is God speaking to you? The question is, are you pausing every day to listen to him? Let's pray. Let's pause. Let's listen. What is it that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, that the Lord is speaking to you right now in response to Psalm 19? Pause and listen. even when our hearts are trying to pause to listen. listen. We might feel a million things tugging at our minds, tugging at our hearts. But Holy Spirit, would you please help us to remember what it is that you spoke to us here today in Psalm 19, that we can always go to your word. And we can always breathe out a bit by putting our feet on the ground in your creation, pausing breathing out breathing out our stresses but then breathing back in your praises Holy Spirit would you please allow the skeptic to say yes to the prompting that's in their heart today and that they would put their faith in you as their creator and savior Jesus would you help the believer to be strengthened by your word today to leave here today being refreshed and renewed, that you are a God who loves us, you are a God who cares about us, who wants to minister to us, who wants to walk with us, who is constantly speaking. We have 24 hours a day, seven days a week access to you. Let us not forget that in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Isaiah 30, 21 says, whether we turn to the right or the left, our ears will hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. May we hear your voice today, Lord, and walk in it.